So good afternoon here on the East Coast. Good morning to everyone moving west. My name is Brian Carey, VP of Marketing here at Unbound Medicine. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today as we discuss a very important topic, the COVID-19 coronavirus outbreak of 2020. This presentation should last about 20 minutes and there may be some time for questions at the end. Please type in any questions into the box on the right hand side of your screen. If we have time to get to them, we will have Paul answer them right on during the, the presentation. If we do not, they will be answered in email to everyone following the presentation. The webinar will be recorded and shared with everyone via email. It will also be loaded within your JHU ABX app in the message center, posted to Relief Central's coronavirus guidelines and uploaded to Unbound Medicine's YouTube channel. Now let me tell you a little about our presenter, Dr. Paul Outwater. Dr. Outwater is a Sherilyn and Ken Fisher Professor of Medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, serving as the Clinical Director for the Division of Infectious Diseases and Director for the Center for Environmental Infectious Diseases. He serves as the Executive Director for the Johns Hopkins Point of Care Information Technology Center, the Pocket Center, producing the Johns Hopkins ABX, HIV, Osler, Psychiatry, and Diabetes Guides. In 2018, Dr. Outwater served as the president for the Infectious Disease Society of America, the largest professional society worldwide related to infectious diseases. At this time, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Outwater. Uh, thank you, Brian, and, and thank you everyone for joining this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I, I hope that today I might uh, convey some useful information. Uh, the talk should probably be called COVID-19, a moving target, because as you know, uh, everyone from public health officials to scientists, we're all learning about this disease and how we should handle this viral infection on the fly. You know, the first slide I have up just makes the point that COVID-19 has been adopted as the name of the disease, just like SARS or, or uh, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, by the World Health Organization. And what was previously called the novel 2019 coronavirus uh, is now called the SARS-CoV-2 virus or SARS-2 CoV that should actually be transposed um, uh, by the, our taxonomy experts. So that's a little bit of nomenclature. And uh, let's see here. The next slide shows the coronavirus in electron microscopy. Now coronaviruses have been with us for a while. They were named here because of the rather unique uh, set of projections around the viral envelope by structural proteins that really mimic a crown and hence the uh, name coronavirus. Now, coronaviruses have been with us for many years. I think they were typically thought of as a infection that most often uh, uh, sickens children and young adults, um, but really can affect people of any age. And there were four uh, routinely circulating strains that caused human infection. And I have this slide here from a recent study from Norway. I think highlights some points that are useful to just make about these coronaviruses that mainly cause respiratory infection. And uh, it accounted for 10% of hospitalizations for uh, respiratory illness in this uh, Norway series. Most were children under two than uh, older ages. And interestingly, 10% of children who were asymptomatic also had coronavirus that was being shed. Interestingly, in Norway, it's always been a seasonal virus, uh, worse uh, during the same respiratory season we all face, such as influenza. But in other countries, coronaviruses have always been found year round, for example, in Thailand. I say this because many people have tried to make comparisons between respiratory viral infections uh, due to these coronaviruses. And then also the two others, which many are aware of, SARS, which uh, really made a brief appearance um, uh, uh, years ago, as well as uh, MERS, uh, which is still ongoing and sporadically problematic, uh, generally again during the winter time uh, on the Arabian Peninsula. Now, uh, this virus, we don't really know where it came from, but 
genetic analyses have suggested that it's closely related to a bat coronavirus. Some people have uh, uh, thought that it may have emerged uh, uh, in China from association with the pangolin, which I knew very little about this animal for trivia experts. This is the only scaled mammal uh, on the planet, and uh, you see some photos there. Uh, but this virus is thought to have jumped from animals to humans and had been adapted. This is from an early paper in the New England Journal that uh, shows you the coronavirus again with the projections, but also the fact that um, uh, the particles are found abundantly in human um, respiratory epithelia, uh, which is shown in some of the arrows in panel B on this slide. Uh, a number of groups have done genetic analyses to try to see where this lands. And uh, what you can see is that this is a standard coronavirus that has both what are called non-structural proteins, NSP, as well as structural proteins. And uh, using those associations finds that it sort of lands itself between what MERS-CoV uh, is genetically and uh, the SARS virus, but uh, is most closely related to bat Corona, uh, coronaviruses uh, there. So uh, hence uh, some of those early associations. And merely the panel on the right shows on the top uh, a, a cell layer that when infected has what's called CPE or cytopathic effect, uh, which suggests that direct viral injury to cells causes cell death. And since this is a virus that moves quickly, this probably at least early on causes much of the disease before immunologic injury. As most people know, this was first described in abundance in Wuhan City in central China, sometimes described as the Chicago of China, uh, going back even 100 years ago because of its industrial past and the fact that it was on a number of rivers, including the Yangtze River. Uh, whether it actually started there or was first described is unclear. Uh, there are many uh, maps, and I just highlighted one here that is uh, provided by the Johns Hopkins CSSE. Many of you may have seen this used by news programs that tries to keep track of this virus uh, on a worldwide basis, uh, both with confirmed cases, mortality figures, and recovery to give some sense of a real-time picture uh, that can help people perhaps make decisions. But of course, all of this is predicated on having available testing. Now, uh, this disease uh, appears to be spread by respiratory droplet, which is how other coronaviruses have all been spread, and this is usually somewhere within a six-foot radius if you are a person that does not cover their sneeze. But uh, these um, uh, particles can also survive on surfaces such as metal, uh, and the thought is it could be aerosolized, especially if you're suctioning or performing respiratory maneuvers, or perhaps even a vigorous NP swab that engenders a vigorous cough, could make it something of an airborne. And of course, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how this is being handled uh, by infection control leaders at this point in time worldwide. Now, a number of early papers from China have really guided what we know so far. And of course, the experience, unfortunately, is widening as we uh, have more cases, especially in Europe, um, and also our uh, abilities to understand what's happened to early patients in the United States. What it seems is that there is a range of illness that might be asymptomatic uh, and mild, especially in younger people, uh, to severe. The incubation period from this early Chinese data suggested about six and a half days. I didn't have time to update a slide, but an Annals of Internal Medicine article synthesizing all the early data suggested it was about 5.6 days. So the idea is if you're exposed and develop symptoms, it's usually about five days. And I think this gives some comfort to the 14-day quarantine that uh, people are suggesting, although there have been a handful of reports of 24 or even 27-day related exposures, but it's always hard to know if someone had been exposed, didn't acquire it, and then had a subsequent exposure. Uh, patients seemed in the Chinese experience to be classically a bit more of a male predominance and often in their late 50s. 
and the highest mortality was seen in patients in their 70s and 80s. Um, compared to Japan and South Korea, which had some of their earlier higher rates of mortality, I mean, uh, higher rates of infection, mortality was less there than in the Wuhan experience. But of course, uh, in Italy, that seems to be mimicking that. Um, some early, uh, some published reports have suggested there's two strains of this SARS-2 CoV. Uh, about um, one that's a bit milder uh, associated with illness, the other uh, with more severe illness. It remains to be seen if this will hold up with further scrutiny. Uh, in terms of clinical presentations, it's a respiratory illness. Uh, and of course, the early descriptions were people with more severe illness. Fever was very characteristic, along with a dry cough and myalgia. Uh, good luck trying to distinguish this from influenza. You really can't, uh, except that uh, at least for people in hospital had uh, problems with uh, shortness of breath and uh, hypoxemia. Occasionally, uh, patients uh, were described as having other flu-like symptoms and even GI upset. Uh, the reports for hospitalized patients in China is that 70% of people had leukopenia, which is something influenza can do, but not to this degree, and perhaps not unusual for pulmonary disease and LDH has elevated. Uh, these are some screenshots. Um, from a number of papers of patients with this uh, infection. And the point was made at least by the radiology group that in the setting of an epidemic, a CTs could provide a diagnosis of SARS-CoV uh, a way ahead of uh, what was then limited testing abilities. And uh, typically the earliest findings were the ground glass infiltrates on CT scan that would become more vigorous. It seems now clear from autopsy studies that have just been released on patients who have died that many of them did have ARDS and a lung fibrosis picture suggesting lung injury. Uh, and difficulties with oxygenation. Uh, for those that recover, it looks like um, Tay 10 is the peak of illness um, and resolution radiographically begins at day 14 after onset of symptoms. Diagnostics, uh, as many uh, know, have been a focal point of discussion in terms of limited abilities here in the United States. I'm glad to say that this has widened uh, significantly. I will tell you that the coronavirus testing that is on certain respiratory multiplex panels does not detect SARS-2-CoV, but instead uh, you would need to use what uh, is available in public health departments or the CDC. Uh, they are still doing testing, but the FDA has now authorized laboratory developed tests by qualified laboratories and hospitals and others such as Quest and LabCorp. Quest and LabCorp have just authorized testing. Uh, LabCorp started last week and Quest just announced yesterday. The turnaround time is three to four days though. And of course the labs will not do the nasopharyngeal swab, uh, which is really the test of choice for most patients in terms of the source, although BAL and others can be employed. So patients would still need to be in a health professional's office setting or medical office to get a swab performed. Serology, unfortunately, is not yet uh, developed sufficiently and employed, which would really give us much better pictures of who's been infected and um, get some sense of what the real denominator of infection is. Uh, so hopefully this will be something that uh, is developed and sufficiently discriminatory between other coronaviruses and SARS-2-CoV infection. Now from the disease course, it does appear from limited studies that um, at least for patients in hospital, about uh, half become hypoxemic, up to about a third develop ARDS. And you have the picture from ICU patients that most need uh, extraordinary assistance if they're ill enough to land in the ICU, uh, unfortunately, which has uh, created a lot of discussion if the infection has become widespread here in the United States or in other countries in terms of uh, do we have enough ventilators? And this was also true during the 2009 pandemic influenza strain. But uh, even though that caused a significant amount of disease, uh, ICUs who were already used to handling seasonal influenza were able to, uh, for the most part, um, handle the extra patients. But I think this is something that is important. 
Everyone wants to know about mortality rates or more properly case fatality rates. Um, the early Wuhan experience was as high as 4.3%. Some have said that in Northern Italy, it seems to be about the same there. Um, other estimates have been lower. Uh, and as I mentioned before, because of the lack of serological testing, we're not really sure. A number of mathematical modelers based on trying to get some idea that if you see a death, that there may be approximately 100 patients infected at 1% or have tried to do some extrapolations. Um, uh, seasonal influenza has often been quoted as having a 0.1% uh, case fatality rate. Um, uh, I think some, most of us feel it'll probably be between 0.5, so uh, three to four times worse uh, than seasonal influenza, but perhaps as high as 2%. And of course, uh, most at-risk populations, such as the elderly, nursing home patients, comorbidities, can be very similar, perhaps, uh, to what we see in community-acquired pneumonia in people over 80, where you have a 10 to 15% mortality rate. Uh, this slide, I don't have time to go in depth, but it uh, gives you some idea of um, what's called the r naught factor, that is how often an infection in a person is capable of being transmitted to others. Coronaviruses such as SARS and MERS have had the unusual aspect of also having super spreader tendencies for reasons we really don't understand how one person can infect many, many more people. Some people have suspected in South Korea, the woman that uh, was infected and visited her church might have had an R uh, of 35, for example. Um, now, uh, uh, the coronaviruses typically have been droplet, as I've already mentioned, for SARS-2, CoV. Um, the CDC is still preferring uh, airborne precautions instead of respiratory droplet that we use for influenza. In terms of therapeutics, it's really only been supportive care and oxygen. Uh, the drug remdesivir, which is um, a Gilead drug, uh, which was developed for uh, Ebola, but had in vitro activity against MERS, CoV, especially even in a primate study where it did help in early treatment post inoculation, also prevented rhesus macaques uh, from being infected when given before inoculation is perhaps the most promising, but any of these antiviral drugs um, uh, probably will work best if given early. And of course, the drug is currently being modeled for severe disease. So uh, we'll see, uh, the thought is there should be results from the China remdesivir study by early April. Uh, but the fact that it's given only with severe illness and it's a parenteral agent, I, I, I wonder how effective this will be. Uh, there's been very limited anecdotal experience elsewhere on its effectiveness. Um, this is a whole host of um, uh, drugs that have been entertained as potentially effective and under clinical trial, either if you look at the uh, Chinese clinical trial site or clinicaltrials.gov at the US. I'll mention just a few, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, uh, many people have discussed because it does seem to interfere with viral reproduction in vitro. Uh, and the thought is it may interfere with cellular acidification and therefore the viral assembly. Um, uh, uh, and another has been anti-IL-6, which actually is part of the guideline, uh, Chinese guideline for COVID-19 for what they call cytokine storm. That's extensive lung disease and severe illness with documented elevated IL-6. The idea here is that it's not antiviral, but trying to tone down the immune effect. Um, the FDA uh, has two different products available. Um, that there's another one whose name escapes me. that are really approved for like rheumatoid arthritis and so on, but tocolizumab specifically uh, also has an FDA indication for a cytokine release syndrome due to oncologic therapy with CAR-T. So uh, <clears throat> there may be some rationale, but again, there's been no real published experience except a press report from China that says it has been effective in some patients. Uh, I'll close by saying many people have uh, trotted out looking at contagion and uh, you know have dusted off this movie from 2011. Uh, Ian Lipkin, a very prominent virologist, um, was uh, one of the advisors for this movie. Even though they had an R naught of two and a case fatality rate of 20%, they didn't quite have the math right. 
but I think the headline, nothing spreads like fear, is definitely true. I think as many of us read newspapers and media, which loves having people read that as well. Not to say this is, should not be underestimated, but it is clearly a parallel epidemic going on with COVID-19 as well. I always caution people, please, to um, beware of fake news. I've had unattributable uh, uh, lists of things sent to me by family, friends, and others asking if it's true. Um, and uh, if things are not verified or from reputable sources, I, I would, as uh, clinicians, as we learn about this, uh, not reinforce what uh, may be uh, uh, inaccurate. Um, prevention, I'll just mention, of course, there's no vaccine. We don't have any chemo prophylaxis available. Uh, we already talked about how the WHO and the CDC has different requirements for protective equipment. Um, and for patients most at risk, you've seen uh, that uh, the CDC has issued that anyone over 60 or with significant health problems uh, should consider social distancing. I'd say this would be also uh, if there's disease in your community, of course, um, I think as testing ramps up, we'll soon have an idea because people with severe pneumonia in hospitals will be checked and they will be sort of the um, sentinel chickens, as it were, or the canaries in the coal mine. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any other maneuvers at the moment and testing is not yet widespread enough to just uh, routinely look at people with respiratory tract infections. So if you're in communities, uh, these would be the reports I think public health officials uh, would be most informative. So in summary, COVID-19 is clearly a moving target. Recommending issues are gonna change frequently. Um, uh, there's clearly a medical impact and it probably will be more severe than severe seasonal influenza. But uh, again, I, I, I do hope that because we have gotten uh, cases here later, uh, some of the social distancing, some of the people taking greater uh, precautions, not going to sick, uh, ill, uh, not going to work and so on, uh, will hopefully help prevent spread. Interestingly, there's data from Japan that shows that since January, when the Chinese outbreak was discussed, seasonal influenza took an abrupt fall probably because people are taking much more care in terms of cough and hand hygiene. Um, so uh, hopefully this may also impact here as well. So wanted to thank very much for listening. I think we do have a few minutes, uh, Brian, for some questions. Absolutely. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Atwater. Um, so the first question would be, if, how long does the virus last on hard surfaces? Yeah, so we know, I, I don't know if I know good SARS-2 COVID data, but from MERS and um, other coronaviruses, there have been reports that with perfect conditions with heat and humidity can last days. But uh, probably if you have relatively comfortable room temperatures and humidity can be up to nine hours, it's probably less on other surfaces. People have often said metal is one of the better surfaces that it may uh, persist upon. This is why, at least in homes with people that might be ill, wiping down high touch surfaces and so on is currently uh, advocated. And um, foam, so-called fomite transmission is definitely a means, uh, which is why people are recommending frequent hand washing as well as not touching your face, because even if you're not around somebody that's coughing, you might pick this up. And this is how other respiratory viruses are often transmitted as well. Fantastic. Um, and I think we have time for one more. So um, it would, it, you went over this a little bit, but who, who specifically is at high risk for COVID-19 and what advice should be given? Yeah, so, so far, I think as data is looked at, the highest risk for disease seems to be for people over 80 and people who are elderly with significant health problems. Um, it's really the same groups, I would say, that if you look at the list for seasonal influenza and people at high risk for complications, it's gonna be the same group. Now, uh, the CDC has said anyone over 60, I'm 58, oh gosh, I guess I'm not at risk. This is not a, you know, a well-defined breakpoint. Seasonal influenza is 65 and older. Um, it's unclear. We really don't know the mechanisms why people get very ill who are older as opposed to children and young adults, which really have not characterized this particular epidemic. Um, 
So, uh, and for those people, I think that's where, if it's if you do have disease in your community, refraining from being it, uh, in areas that I would call a numbers game, where there's lots of people, lots of interactions, lots of surfaces that people have to touch doors and so on and so forth. You know, that's where uh, your risks are gonna be higher. And unfortunately it's whether it's busy restaurants, theaters, uh, church, um, uh, uh, mass events, and I think you've seen some disparities in why in some communities uh, schools are closed and Italy is sort of following the, the China playbook in terms of trying to quell uh, the spread of the virus. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of discussion amongst uh, specialists at this point, what's the right approach, um, the right balance uh, here, and uh, I think we'll have different experiences that, uh, unfortunately, um, we've not really had this playbook before, so we're all learning on the fly and trying to juggle. Um, but uh, the the ability to slow the spread, I think, would be most uh, helpful for the most fragile of uh, our older adult populations, um, and and I think that's the reason many people are considering what to do as well as to protect uh, people in uh, employment, uh, families and so on. Um, but uh, there will no doubt be some disruptions and I think the suggestion is there could be uh, uh, more locally based uh, government edicts than something that would be nationwide. Fantastic. Um, okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Outwater. That's, uh, that's uh, the time that we have today. There were some questions that came through regarding um, the, the getting the slides or more um, of this information. Just to remind everyone that the, the webinar was recorded. Um, it will be sent uh, to everyone that attended, um, registered, uh, and it will also be available um, in various sources. So we'll, we'll make sure that we uh, alert everyone to that. Um, also wanna let everyone know that the, um, that the COVID and coronavirus topics within the Johns Hopkins ABX guide um, both in the app and on hopkinsguides.com were, were updated just today, so the latest information um, is available. Um, if you are, uh, if you currently have that product, um, you can sync um, right now and, and you'll have all of the latest uh, information. Um, and always advise you to, to go to hopkinsguides.com um, for more information about the products uh, or the updates that we have. At this time, just want to thank everyone for attending um, and thank Dr. Atwater for his, uh, his presentation. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope you all stay well and healthy. Thank you.